Hi everyone, uh, my name's Dave Tsao, and today I'll be talking about structured declarative data visualization in Clojure. So uh, this is where you can find me on the internet, and uh, mostly I'll be talking about a library I wrote called Jeptus, and you can find that on GitHub. Okay, so the problem we're trying to solve is how do you look at data in Clojure? Uh, this is a well-solved problem in other ecosystems. For example, in R, there's ggplot2, which is kind of like my personal favorite. Um, but in Python, there's also uh, matplotlib and a host of other programs that are built on top of matplotlib to do uh, graphics work. Um, so I'd argue in Clojure, the stories for doing data visualization are not as well developed and hopefully today I'll convince you uh, some of the features that you really kind of want to have in a data visualization library and that I've been attempting to build into Jeptus. Okay, so why do we want to visualize data in the first place? Um, in this talk, I'll assume that there are really two uh, things on your mind. Either you want to test a hypothesis or answer a question that um, can be gleaned from your data, or you've already got this insight that you want to share with everyone else, and so you need to com you know, communicate it to um, other people. And you know, the best way to tell someone else about uh, quantitative data is through a plot. What I won't be talking about today are some, you know, a lot of the work that goes into getting your data in a presentable form to analyze. So this is stuff like ranking your data from many different sources and munching them together and also reshaping it so that you can easily plot it. Okay, so in this talk, we are essentially on a quest for insights from our data. And just like Monty Python and the Holy Grail, while we are exploring our data, we might run into uh, all sorts of different characters that cause us to potentially uh, stop for a minute and think, hmm, that's really strange. I wonder why that's happening. Um, or we might run into other people that we just have to uh, hack our way through. Um, we might also run into obstacles that are so insurmountable that we have no choice but to go around them. And this is, uh, these are really all just obstacles you might encounter while you're seeking uh, truth. Uh, so really upon any time you actually look at your data, often your assumptions become shattered or you know, if you're really lucky and you have great intuition into your problem domain, you just refine your assumptions. Um, lots of times when you look at your data, you realize, oh wait, you know, this question I had in mind originally, it's actually not that important. What's a lot more important is something else that I found uh, through some feature that exists in the data. And as always, when we're working with real world stuff, there's gonna be pitfalls that we'll need to avoid. Um, and what these issues mean is that we need a rapid prototyping tool for data because that will allow us to uh, continually refine our assumptions. It will allow us to also just, you know, answer a lot, a lot of questions more quickly and easily. And it also allows us to gauge the impact of uh, outliers or messy data or unreliable data on our analyses. Um, so I would argue that what we really need is an interactive domain-specific lang language for data visualization. And luckily the statistics community has been thinking about this for a long time. And they've come up with something called uh, the grammar of graphics. And uh, it's pretty widely implemented. Uh, maybe the most used implementation is ggplot2, which is for R. Um, it stands for grammar of graphics plot. Um, today I'll be talking a lot more about a different implementation called Vega, which is for JavaScript. And the library I wrote called Gyptus is essentially a bunch of wrapper functions around Vega. Okay, so to illustrate the power of a DSL, here's kind of like a quick pop quiz. Uh, try to figure out what this piece of code does. Don't worry if you don't get it, you're kind of not meant to. 
Um, but does it help you if I translate it into SQL for you? Um, hopefully it does help a lot. And so that's why uh, DSLs are powerful, right? They're a lot more human readable and human writable. But even better is if we have an interactive REPL at our disposal, because that means we can just type the code into the REPL and get the answer back out. So um, what the code did was it was trying to filter out uh, phone numbers and names that have uh, country equals US. And so just as uh, SQL dramatically increases your ability to manipulate data, as hopefully this example showed, uh, a graphics DSL will similarly increase your productivity in data exploration. Uh, so before I get into some more live examples, uh, first I want to go over how difficult plotting can be if you're using tools that don't really inherently speak, I guess, grammar of graphics. Uh, so Gyptis, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is built off of Vega, this JavaScript library for constructing plots. Um, Vega builds itself as a visualization grammar. And Vega itself is built off of D3, um, which stands for data-driven documents. And D3 is a library for uh, really just like ma manipulating the DOM and linking it up to a data source. So we'll just go through three examples. Um, this is how you make a bar chart in D3. This is kind of like the hello world of D3 that I took directly from uh, Mike Bostock's website who wrote the D3. And this text is probably pretty small. Um, it doesn't really matter if we read all of it, but I do want to point out that <clears throat> it is an HTML document, so you're um, in the DOM. And it's kind of a lot of lines of code, right, to make a simple bar chart. It's imperative because, you know, you've taken this bar uh, elements and you're appending a bunch of elements and you're setting attributes. And uh, you're also really, like, manipulating the DOM pretty directly. Uh, if we look at how to make a bar chart in Vega, um, the first thing to notice is uh, we're no longer in the DOM. We're actually using JSON. So it's a declarative format in that uh, what you're writing is data and you're not ri really writing code anymore. Um, if you look at the keys of this object, they look like they have to do with plots. You know, the keys are scales, axes, data, etc. cetera. Um, but this is still also fairly verbose. It's maybe uh, 40 lines of uh, JSON. So if you wanted to really like sort of iteratively and interactively make plots and explore your data, you know, typing out 40 lines of JSON every time you wanted to uh, make a new plot would get pretty tedious pretty quickly. Uh, so finally, we come to how to do how to make a bar chart in Gyptis, and it's uh, almost a one-liner. And uh, behind the scenes, it's actually taking in uh, the data and the spec you give it and generating a Vega specification. So, if we look at the technology hierarchy again, uh, what we see is that. D3 is um, really about DOM manipulation. That's probably what you're going to spend 90% of your time thinking about. If you move up one level to Vega, um, you're, you're, you're thinking a little bit more about graphics primitives. You're thinking about, okay, what kind of scale do I use? Do I want to use bars or circles for a bar chart or a scatter plot, um, respectively? And if we move up to Gyptis, uh, my hope is that we'll be in a state where uh, making plots is so easy, you spend the vast majority of your time thinking about data and the relationships uh, contained in your data. So at its heart, Gyptis is really just a closure library for generating and viewing Vega plots. And so this has two components. The generating part is essentially a collection of pure functions that take in data and generate uh, Vega plot specifications. And remember, Vega plot specifications is just JSON. Uh, the second part 
viewing Vegaplot is uh, a WebSocket server that sends this generated JSON to your browser um, and to the Vega JavaScript library to render it into uh, either Canvas or SVG elements so you can actually see it on your screen. Um, so for the interest of time, I think I'm just going to skip uh, some of these slides here. I described the Vega grammar. And I'll just go straight to the demonstration. Okay. So I have um, some example code set up here. And so this is going to be on GitHub, so um, you can edit it later to your heart's content. Uh, so let's just look at some of the imports. We're doing some uh, closure helper tools. Um, later on, I'll be using Amazon Web Services to uh, query for data and present the dashboard. And of course, we need to import the uh, ship disk namespaces. OK, so the first thing is a plot specification is just data. So here we have um, three rows, and the columns are uh, a letter and how frequently that letter uh, occurs in regular language. And so if we plot this, oh, sorry, that actually just defined it. So if we look at the output of this function, letter plot, um, what we'll see here is that we have a closure hash map that corresponds to the Vega JSON that gets rendered to a plot. <clears throat> and so you have things like legends, axes, width, height. And if we call this function plot with that uh, hash map, it opens up a browser and we get this nice uh, bar chart. And on this bar chart, we have on the x-axis, A, B, C. So that looks like it's doing the right thing because you know when we defined this specification, I said I wanted x to map to letter. And on the y-axis, we have uh, numbers that correspond to the frequency. Uh, so for this uh, bar, the A bar here, it looks like it reaches a height of a little bit over 0 0.08. And if we go back to our original data, we can see that, yes, the frequency is 0 0.08 something something something. OK. Um, let's see if there are any questions so far. OK. Yeah, these I can answer at the end. OK, so the next example is to point out that since this is built off of Vega, it's um, inherently highly customizable, well-documented, and feature-rich, because Vega are all those things. Uh, rather, Vega is all those things. And it's also built for the web. So if we take our letter plot again <clears throat> and we plot it, of course, we're going to get the same result. So this plot hasn't changed. Uh, keep your eyes on this half of the screen as I go through and uncomment this. If we wanted to change uh, the transparency of these bars, um, we all we have to do is manipulate the hash map to uh, set a uh, fill opacity value. So if I send this to the REPL again and execute it, you can see that the bars are now uh, a more transparent color. And uh, as I hover over, it's not doing anything. So maybe we would like to add a mouse hover interaction. So Vega also allows you to do that by having a hover property set. And if I execute this again, now when I go over to the chart and hover over the bars, they turn red. Uh, so uh, Vega supports quite a lot of uh, nifty things. Uh, some more examples, we can do things like uh, change color scheme, how far apart the bars are spaced, change the size of the chart, and add labels. So this is the same idea. We're taking this letter plot, we're modifying the object, and we're sending it to this plot function. So let's get back to our original plot. If we try to change the width, we can see that it gets changed. Uh, same thing for the height. 
we can modify how much white space is in between each bar. Um, we can add a title, more titles, and you can change the color of the bars. Okay. So there are a lot of templates included for common plot types. And what this does is, um, you know, everyone knows what a bar chart looks like. Everyone knows what a scatter plot looks like. Everyone knows what a pie chart looks like. So people already have this existing framework in which they expect uh, quantitative data to be presented in a graphical manner. So if you have these templates, it's a lot, if you follow these templates, it's a lot easier to communicate to other people. It turns out it's also a lot easier to answer questions of your data because you know, there are only like maybe five or six common ways to plot your data. So if you're kind of stuck and you're at a loss for what to do, uh, you can really just randomly pick a plot, you know, and see, you know, inspect the result and see if anything interesting comes out of it. Um, and it also lower, lowers the learning curve because if you have templates, you know, that means you have defaults already set that are going to be uh, fairly good. Okay, so I have some data here uh, and we're just going to take a look at it. And this is pretty similar to what we had before. We have a list of hash maps. Each hash map is like a row in a table. And so I'm looking down at the REPL now. And so what this means is in the English language, the letter A occurs 0 0.08 uh, of the time. And for the letter E, you, it occurs about 12% of the time for English. Uh, we can also look at the last part of this data set, letter frequency. And so there's also the Spanish language in here. Um, so let's just feed this letter frequency table into a dodged bar. Okay, and what did this do? It looks like we have letters on the x-axis and we have uh, numbers on the y-axis and what i told it to do was to plot letter on x frequency on y so that seems to make sense uh, we have a whole bunch of different colors uh, fill i'm just uh, bars i guess terminology from css i told it to color the bars by the language and if we scroll over uh, there's a legend showing English, French, German, Spanish, it got truncated, but you know we can fix that later. I just wanted to keep the code simple though for this example. And it's a dodged bar, which means um, all of these bars are put side by side. So what you can see from this is, you know, maybe some interesting features like for the letter A here, uh, this tan bar is a lot higher than everything else. Uh, the, that color corresponds to the Spanish language. And so the interpretation is the Spanish language uses the letter A much more frequently than uh, English, French, or German. Uh, this bar here is very high for all the languages. That corresponds to the letter E. Okay, so that kind of makes sense to use a vowel. Um, if you know Morse code, E is also the shortest uh, thing in Morse code. It's just a dot. And Morse code is optimized so that uh, the most frequent letters are the shortest to uh, type out into Morse code. So this seems to make sense as well. And uh, this orange bar, German, uses E the most. Okay, I'm just gonna take a quick peek to see if there are any questions. Nope. Yeah, if, if you guys get lost, uh, please feel free to ask a question. I'll try to uh, periodically check it to make sure uh, you guys just don't get totally lost here. Okay, so we can also make a very similar plot using the stacked bar. Uh, so stacked bar means instead of putting everything side by side horizontally, you put it on top of each other vertically. And I've also changed this to the plot spec a little bit. So now we're looking at languages on the x-axis, uh, frequencies on the y-axis, and each letter is now a color. Uh, so you can see, just as a sanity check, the English language has all the uh, letter frequencies summing up to one. So that's good. That means you know we our data isn't completely messed up. Um, 
However, that's not the case for French, German, or Spanish. Um, it's, you know, around 0.95. And when I first saw this, you know, I thought, oh, that's kind of strange. I must have made a mistake. Of course, you know, these letter frequencies have to sum to one. Uh, but then, you know, I realized French, German, and Spanish, uh, they use non-ASCII characters as well. Like if you'll notice uh, in our legend here, it's only A through Z. So we're not including uh, non-ASCII characters like umlauts or uh, any of the other vowels that have uh, tildes or other marks over them. Okay, so we have dodge bars and stack bars. And by changing how you map each column in this data set to an aesthetical attribute on the plot, you can do a lot of different analyses. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is um, faceting. So faceting is essentially making a bunch of different uh, plots side by side. So if I take my letter frequency data, uh, just to remind you, it looks like this. It's a big table that has letters, frequencies, and languages. And I wanted to make a stacked bar out of it. Uh, so on the x-axis, I have letters. and the y-axis, I have frequency. Um, you'll see for each letter, I actually have four bars. And that's because I have four languages in my data set. Uh, but this is sort of like a nonsensical plot. There's not much um, information you can glean out of this. Um, because what it's telling you is essentially, you know, if you combine all these four languages together, you can see which letters are used the most and which letters are used the least. Um, but if you just wanted to like look at how much each language is, each language uses a letter, it's not that helpful. Uh, what we can do though is we can feed this uh, the specification generated by the stacked bar function, and we can feed it into another function that will uh, take a spec and return a spec. So it's sort of like uh, middleware, uh, and that's this facet grid function, and what it does is make generate subplots in the vertical direction. Uh, well, vertical and horizontal direction too, but here I'm only telling it to use the vertical direction. And I'm telling it to make each subplot uh, correspond to a different language. So you can see now we have, we can see how the uh, letter frequency varies for just English by itself in this top one, French for the second one, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now we're gonna do something kind of fun. Um, I've put this uh, data set into a SQL table. And so, I, and in this table, I've also included um, the letter frequencies for mystery text. And we're going to try to deduce what language that mystery text is in based on the letter frequencies. So. If we do a quick inspection of what's in this table, it looks exactly as before. There's letter, frequency, language. Um, what's different now is I've also appended uh, the mystery language to it. So if we try to look at how many letters there are, select language and the number of rows we get by grouping by language, we can see we have French, Spanish, German, and English. And now we also have a mystery language and we're only considering the uh, ASCII letters. Okay, so how do we try to figure out what language mystery one is? Um, well, let's just make the same plot we did before. So this is the same uh, stack bar plot, but now there's mystery on the end. Uh, so you can see what I'm doing here is I'm querying for data um, this is this just returns the entire table. And then I'm feeding that data into the stack bar spec, and then I'm plotting it, which sends it to the browser. And so here's mystery one, and it kind of looks like it's most similar to Spanish because this pink bar matches up, and this blue bar matches up, and this orange one does, and so on and so forth. And it gets kind of maybe not so good later on, but uh, it doesn't seem to be 
the following mystery one doesn't seem to follow any of the other bars but you know maybe that's just because i put spanish and mystery one next to each other so our eye naturally thinks oh okay it must be closest to spanish what we can do is uh, modify our query a little bit so we only look at the mystery one in german uh, languages plot it again and you know it looks worse mystery one you know the pink bars whereas they matched up with mystery one in spanish they don't really match up with mystery one in german and you know one thing we could do is we could repeat this process for every different language so we could change this to english and look at the results and we can change it to french and look at the result um, but i think there's a much better way so instead of sort of manually trying to look at every two combinations of languages and replotting it, we can write a query to do it for us. And uh, instead of explaining this query, I'm just going to walk you through the result. <clears throat> so this letter cross product table, uh, now instead of having one language, we have two, language A and we have language B. And what we, we're doing is we're looking at the letter A across these two languages. Let's actually look at the bottom row. So for, let, for the letter A, what this row says is that German uses the letter A uh, 0.065 of the time, whereas English uses the letter A uh, 0.82 of the time. And so now we can easily uh, do a pairwise comparison for every language. So what this plot is doing is uh, I faceted both on X and Y. So here's how to read it. Um, let's just look at the top left subplot. So the way to read this is every dot is a different color and every color corresponds to a letter. So every dot is a letter. In this case, I think it's E because we previously determined that was the most frequent number. And on the uh, Y axis here, that number is how frequently that letter occurs in English. And on the x-axis, it's, well, in the case of this one subplot, it's how frequently it occurs in English as well. And so that's why you see a perfect x equals y line here, because um, you're only comparing English against English. Uh, for this second plot here, you're comparing English against French. Uh, so it no longer forms a straight perfect line. It's now deviating from it. And the larger the deviations from that perfect line we saw earlier, the uh, less similar English and French are. Okay, so now let's just hop over to this mystery one column. And to figure out what language mystery one is, all we need to do is figure out which plot looks the most like a straight uh, X equals Y line. And of course, if we compare mystery one against itself, it forms that perfect line. If we do it against English, you know, it doesn't look quite so good. If we do it against French, it doesn't look quite so good. Or German, it doesn't look quite so good. But if we do it against Spanish, it actually looks pretty good. Uh, so from this plot, I'd say we can be pretty safe in concluding that mystery one uh, is a Spanish language text. And now I can sort of pull back the covers and tell you, yes, it is actually Spanish. It's uh, Don Quixote. So. It's a very, very long Spanish text. Okay. So that was uh, the letter frequency example. Um, hopefully what you got out of it was you can do very sophisticated and complex analyses, like um, figuring out what language a text comes from. And really actually not that many lines of code. Uh, so here it was just a query and then the actual plotting um, was very compact. Uh, so if you're doing some sort of exploratory data analysis, uh, the compactness is very nice because it means you can very quickly iterate and change uh, the types of analyses you're doing. Uh, so the second half of my example is uh, how do you make a dashboard? So um, it's not too important what the code is doing. I just want to show you the result. Uh, here I've, I have a go loop that's basically updating once a second and sending a random number between 0 and 1 to this plot here. The x-axis is a timestamp, um, so that's why you see uh, something that looks like set, 
it looks like seconds on the x-axis. Okay, and we can stop that. And we can also make a more sophisticated dashboard. Uh, so in my daily work, I do a lot of uh, genomics data processing. And this is a very bursty kind of workload, so it makes a lot of sense for me to uh, buy spot instances from Amazon. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, spot instances are a way for you to uh, bid in an auction for unused uh, servers in EC2. And the what you get is usually really cheap instances, but at the risk of having those instances uh, disappear at any moment. So they're really ephemeral. Uh, so you know, different uh, availability zones will have different prices auction prices for each instance. So one thing I like to do is to just inspect uh, what the auction prices are, the historical prices are for every uh, every availability zone and use that to guide me towards a decision for which availability zone I should use. So um, here is the plot. Uh, the data is a pH here. So here's the data. And hopefully you can exp you know what's coming. It's going to be another list of hash maps. This hash map has a timestamp, an instance type, availability zone, a spot price, and a product description. And then I'm feeding it into uh, this plot here. So I'm making points. It's, I'm telling it to you know, plot the x-axis vertically now. And I'm also faceting. Uh, so if we look at this plot, you can see there's uh, different uh, types of instances available, Linux versus Windows. Uh, Windows is a lot more expensive, as you can see here, because Windows is like 40 cents versus uh, Linux up here is like 10 cents. Um, the C3.xlarge instance is about half as expensive as the C3.2xlarge. So dark blue is like half as light blue. And it looks like this, the prices are kind of all the same in every every availability zone. So in this case, um, I'd probably just choose whichever availability zone has the most dots. Um, just sort of superstitious belief that the more data you have probably means you know the more reliable that uh, availability zone is. Um, I can also do things like monitor CPU usage. So let's just kind of initialize all this code. Um, so what I was doing there was I was initializing the CPU util table. And again, it's a list of hash maps. It's got a timestamp, the average CPU in units of percent on a per instance basis. And so now if I take that data and I plot it, um, you can see I have this instance sitting at, you know, basically 0% CPU utilization for the past week. So I probably should have shut this down a while ago. And every day it looks like it peaks up a little bit, maybe because it's uh, running a cron job or something like that. And uh, since these are all, uh, you know, web URLs, you can embed it as an iframe into something that looks a little bit prettier. So this is something I've basically, this is, I'm going to copy and paste a template that I essentially took off the internet from uh, Keen. So now if I go back, so now if I go back and I execute all these plots again, um, you know, they're embedded within this sort of prettier looking uh, UI. Okay, so that was the demo. And we can go back to the presentations. Okay, so let's play this. So if you get nothing else from this presentation, hopefully you walk away with the idea that um, a plotting tool 
that uses the grammar of graphics is essentially mapping columns in your data table into aesthetic attributes of, uh, of a graphic. And those attributes, in the case of a bar plot, are going to be x and y position, the width of the bar, the height of the bar, what color the bar is. Um, for a scatter plot, it's going to be x and y position of each circle, the color or fill, the border, how big it is in terms of the radius, and maybe even the opacity. Uh, more concretely, in the examples I showed you, we took this uh, table. We said, OK, I want letter to correspond to the x position of the bar. I want the frequency to correspond to the height. And I want the language to correspond to the color. And based on the stack bar template we were using, it figured out things like what the y position should be. Uh, so the y position should be like, you know, on top of the previous bar. Uh, when we were trying to figure out what language this mystery one text is, uh, we had we generated a table that allowed us to compare uh, two different languages side by side very easily. And we split it up so that uh, on the x axis, we can look at how frequently um, a letter occurs in mystery one. On the y axis, we can look at how frequently that letter occurs in the language German. And then we can just visually look at how closely uh, our result follows a straight line and use that to conclude uh, that mystery one was actually Spanish. Okay, so Jyptus is in alpha, so I welcome any suggestions. And now I will take your questions. And so I think we're looking over here. Have you look at Gorilla REPL and its plotting functions? Would be cool to combine Gyptus with this. Uh, so I've looked at it a little bit, and I think actually Gorilla REPL, um, it uses Vega, so the same uh, JavaScript framework that Gyptus is built on. So it uses Vega to generate all, all its plots. Um, and I agree, it would be really cool to combine uh, Gyptus with the Gorilla REPL. Um, I think it could be fairly easily composed um, if you wanted to, because um, I've tried to make it so that most of the core Gyptus functions are pure functions that take data and return Vega specs. And uh, speaking sort of like, you know, in principle, it shouldn't be too troublesome to send those generated specs uh, to the Gorilla REPL. But yeah, can you, oops, I think I messed up here. Okay, next question is, can you recommend a primer for grammar of graphics for the conceptual underpinnings, et cetera? Uh, yeah, so the uh, text I used was actually the ggplot2 textbook. Um, let's try to find what that's called. Yes, Elegant Graphics for Data Analysis. So this is actually very practical. Um, it teaches you a lot about how to do data analysis and you know in which instances you would want to use a bar chart versus a, a, a scatter plot, you know, how to correctly use color in your graphics as well, and a lot of other very useful things. Um, I think the original text is Grammar of Graphics by Wilkinson. Um, I haven't really read this too carefully. Uh, but if you really want to, I guess, deep dive into the theoretical underpinnings, that would be the book to get. Okay. Let's see, is it difficult to style the output SVG? Can you use normal CSS for this? Maybe combine it with Garden. Um, so I don't really know what Garden is, so I can't speak to that. Um, I, so I'm targeting Vega as sort of the um, uh, presentation layer. So uh, anything that you can do with Vega, you could uh, in principle do here as well, just by, as I was showing you, uh, associating a whole bunch of different keys and values onto the resulting map. Um, I don't really know how easy it is to manually use CSS to style Vega. 
Um, I don't know how well supported that is, but it would. Um, the answer to your question is it's as easy to style as as Vega is. So I would have to look at the documentation in Vega to answer that question. Okay, I think we're almost out of time. Cool demo on GitHub, but I get compiler exception. Uh oh. Hmm. Okay, I'll look into that and <laughs> maybe respond. Uh, maybe I'll open an issue and respond on GitHub for what's going on here. But thanks for the bug report. That's good to know. Okay, um, I think my time is up. Uh, thank you very much for viewing, and I hope you uh, enjoyed the talk. And so...